Greetings. Welcome, everyone. Amazing turnout. We're so grateful for everyone who signed up and are taking time out of your day or morning to hang out with us. Just to start out, we love hearing where you're from. If you could type that into the chat, it'd be amazing. And once people get settled in their virtual seats, we'll get started. Welcome to six frameworks to consider in UX, strengthening your product, team, professional development, and more, featuring Leith Ulabi, Director of User Research at Udemy. It's hosted by SDXD in partnership with Boulder Design and sponsored by Tiled. My name is James and I'm the president of SDXD and I'd just like to thank my fellow organizers as well as our volunteers. And now I will hand the stage off to Jake of Boulder Design. Hey everybody, I'm Jake. Uh, we have Chris here too from Boulder Design. So we're excited to, uh, to team up here with uh, SDXD on our first, our first two live, true live collaboration event. We've collaborated a lot behind the scenes, but this is the, the first real one. So super excited. Thanks, James. Awesome. Thanks, Jake and Chris. We appreciate it. Love bringing our communities together. And just a quick shout out to UX Coffee Hours. If you haven't heard of it or visited it already, we cannot recommend it enough. You can sign up for an hour of mentorship with an amazing coach like Leith. No strings attached, it's totally free. So go to uxcoffeehours.com for more information. And also thank you to our sponsor Tiled for providing this webinar. They specialize in what's called micro apps. And it's really a way to express your creativity without code. So here at SDXD, we use it for our recap website where we post all of our videos. And we've seen some other very creative use cases like for portfolios or user research repositories. So thank you to Tiled for providing this. Just a little video from them showing how static interactions, that's so yesterday. It's all about micro apps now. I don't know, I, I don't think you all had the audio to that, but there was some pretty awesome music there. Uh, <laughs> apologize I didn't share that properly. It's probably a little more boring without the music, but it was good. I was going to try, but yeah, I don't think I could have replicated that with my mouth. So we'd also like to invite you to join our next event on December 2nd. It's the Fundamentals of Icon Design featuring Noah Jacobus from MetaLab. And also it is time to get toasty on December 10th. We are doing a virtual UX holiday pajama party. More information is available on both of our meetup pages. There's going to be a cocktail party, a TikTok dance lesson and class, as well as trivia, baking, and much, much more. And finally, the moment that you have all been waiting for, tonight's event. So we're going to have a presentation by Leith, followed by audience Q&A. And then finally, if you have time and interest, we'll do some post-event networking in breakout rooms. Just a friendly reminder, we are on the webinar, so you'll see that Q&A button on the bottom. Please place your questions in there. It makes it a lot easier for us to keep track of. And now, let me just say a little bit about Leith before I invite him to the virtual stage here. Laith Ulavi is the Director of User Research at Udemy, an online learning marketplace. He previously worked for companies like Uber, Ship, Google, and Answer Lab, as well as in the public sector with fellowships at the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution and the United Nations Center for Humanitarian Data. With an academic background in ethnographic research, Ulavi has taught at UCLA, Georgetown University, 
the UC Berkeley Extension and the UC Berkeley School of Information. And fun fact, he's a big fan of dried mangoes. You guys are in for such a treat. If you have a note-taking app, I highly recommend opening it now because we are about to get 45 plus minutes of pure value. Without further ado, let's give a warm, warm welcome to tonight's featured speaker, Leif Ulibi. Thank you so much uh, to the, the Boulder and um, San Diego crews here. Really amazing, uh, super excited to be here chatting. And while my bio sounds so much more um, official and fancy when James reads it out with that uh, enunciation than when I sort of hear it in my own voice. So love it. And uh, thank you, thanks everyone for bearing with the, the technical problems and things like that, but we are uh, locked and loaded now. So um, always good to start off a presentation with a little bit of disappointment, but um, I build this as six frameworks. I'm actually only gonna go through five. Um, hopefully um, I won't get any sort of angry messages um, as we dive into this. So why are frameworks important? Um, and you know, why did I think this was uh, something sort of worth sharing with folks? Um, frameworks are really important for a few reasons. One, they help us to recognize patterns and more rapidly assess situations. So there's this classic thing, the way our brains work, we're constantly either um, adding information when we don't have enough, or we're deleting information when we have too much or it gets in the way. So the eyes are a great example of this, right? Those are the very center, the pupil of your eyes is actually a blind spot, but your brain fills in that, that data. So we're not sort of walking around with these sort of like floating uh, sort of um, uh, um, voids. Uh, similarly, most of us can actually see our nose in our field of vision, but our brain edits that out because it's not useful. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, being aware that this is sort of what our brain is doing and, and figuring out how to cope with both in, uh, information uh, paucity and information overload. That's a place where frameworks can be super uh, valuable. Another one, it allows us to more productively leverage past experience in new contexts. So, you know, having that moment of, oh, I've seen this before, or I recognize this, so now I know what to do, or now I know how to act. Um, and then this, this one, they, they provide us the mental models to understand complex systems. So again, a lot of times as, as folks working in the UX world, we're dealing with very complex products, very complex human interactions and dynamics. We need to be able to distill that down and sort of develop that mental model. And um, uh, uh, framework can be really important for that. And then the last one, which is, which is perhaps the most important, is it gives us a shared language and understanding. Um, a lot of times when I've seen product teams uh, struggling or having problems, it's not just that people are disagreeing, it's that they're actually talking past each other. They have different reference points. They're, they're looking at it through a different lens and a framework can really help us to make sure we're on the same page. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of famous frameworks that we're already very familiar with. And so just a couple examples. So on the left, we have examples of dark patterns. And, you know, these are the, the uh, interactions that, that some organizations, hopefully not the ones that we're all affiliated with, do that might be manipulative or, or might sort of take advantage of people. And that's an example of a taxonomy, right? So we've developed a framework that lays out different kinds of dark patterns. And so we can go beyond just saying like, hey, this doesn't really seem right, or I'm not sure about the ethics of this, but we can actually say, hey, this is an example of con for shaming. And here's why that's bad and why we shouldn't be doing that. Or here's an example of a roach motel. That's one of the, 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 the types. And you know, here's why it fits that criteria and why we shouldn't be doing that. So it allows us to have that shared understanding beyond just like, oh, you know, something about this doesn't sit right. The other, uh, you know, classic example I, I put on the screen here is that of the double diamond, uh, and that we go through these sort of different phases as we're well, thinking about developing products. And so this would sort of be an example of a framework around processes. And so you know, imagine going into a design review, and you're in this discover phase but other people are giving you feedback as if you're in the deliver phase, right? So that's an example of how this helps us to make sure we're on the right stage. Um, as we're teaching more junior designers, we can sort of help them walk them through sort of what the process is and understand uh, the, the different things we might do at the different stages. So this is an example of, of a process framework. So just to you know, kind of orient folks to what I mean by frameworks. So my goal today is I want to uh, you know, introduce you to some frameworks that have just sort of been on my mind lately that I've been thinking about that I think are interesting that intersect with a lot of the different sort of parts of doing user experience work. I wanna talk a little bit about how frameworks work. Um, and I wanna challenge you to start leveraging frameworks and, and thinking about how to use your own. Now, um, 
we're going to talk about five different frameworks. Uh, it's a lot of information, and I'm going to be covering them at a, at a relatively superficial level. Um, so it's going to be a lot. We're going to be going through this really quickly. So um, don't be scared. Uh, there's a free, there's a handout that I have with some links and further information. So if we're going through this and, and something really grabs your attention, there'll be opportunities for you to circle back and sort of dig in in more depth. You don't have to, you know, sort of, sort of worry about that it's going to be a fleeting thing and you're never going to uh, be able to uh, get uh, exposure to it again. So excited to go through this. And, and sort of the idea is here that by talking through these five frameworks as sort of case studies, it'll help us sort of um, flesh out in our mind, elaborate in our mind a little about how might we, we might think about this. Cool. So the first one is at the experience level, um, sort of the core of what we do, making products, making experiences, and all these kinds of things. And, you know, everyone loves a buzzword. And, you know, one of the ones that, that is continually in our industry is that of gamification. And I think when we think about gamification, you know, and it comes up in different uh, contexts, a lot of times it's like, let's make badges. Let's put a badge on it. It's a little like in a Portlandia when they, you know, if, if you're familiar with that show and sort of this like put a bird on it. And, and yet that's a, a pretty lightweight way. It's a pretty incomplete way of thinking about gamification. But I think a lot of folks kind of revert to it because it's the most common shared point of understanding. So I'd like to put forward the first framework. And this is a framework done by Yu Kai Chao. And it's called the Octalysis Framework. And it's Octalysis because there's eight. And so he's created this system, these eight levels, these eight different categories of ways that we can think about gamification. And, uh, you know, so for instance, that top one, meaning, which, which he calls epic meaning and calling, and, and it's sort of uh, 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 truncated here. And so an example of like, why the heck would people write encyclopedia articles, right? There's almost, it, it doesn't even make sense in a lot of ways, but yet people contribute to Wikipedia. And a big part of that reason is that it makes them feel like they're, they're making humanity better. They're contributing to this larger uh, project. You know, it really appeals to their better angels. So that's sort of an example of that. Um, we're all um, uh, familiar with sort of the, the unpredictability in the, in the lower right hand corner. So this is the classic thing we learn about in psychology with like the Skinner box that if you give a rat a lever and whenever they press the lever, they get one food pellet, you know, they hit it when they're hungry. But as soon as it's unpredictable, sometimes when the rat hits the lever, they get zero. Sometimes they get one, sometimes they get three. It starts to really, you know, create these dopamine responses and these different, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, responses to that experience. And it becomes exciting and interesting and they'll just get really into it. So that slot machine phenomenon, so that unpredictability plays in a different way. Um, uh, ownership, you know, there's the, the ex example that if there's two bookcases from Ikea and you built one of them and not the other, you will feel a stronger attachment to that second bookcase that you built because you kind of have this sense of ownership and sort of uh, accomplishment that sort of pays into it and all these kind of things. So he's created this great framework of these sort of eight categories and then sort of different subcategories. What makes this really powerful though, is that he then on top of this layers other things, right? So for instance, the uh, examples on the right of your screen come mostly from intrinsic motivation. Um, so they're coming from uh, sort of inside you. So that sense of empowerment or that unpredictability is really an inner uh, uh, sort of motivator. Whereas the ones on the left are really this extrinsic motivator that maybe the situation or the context or the game is providing. And how, you know, these are sort of different mechanisms to think about. But there's also a vertical access uh, sort of at play here. So the ones at the top tend to be very positive motivators. So again, accomplishment, empowerment, meaning, you know, these are really sort of aspirational and appeal to us in these ways. Whereas the ones on the bottom, you know, we might experience some of these during a pandemic. You know, there's unpredictability, there's scarcity, there's avoidance that, you know, we're, the opportunity costs that we're sort of having to try and think about. And so those are the negative motivators. And this is so powerful because we have to think about the mix of both the right to the left and the top to bottom, and they're so important. And, you know, um, I work at a learning company. And so a lot of times folks want to learn, but it's hard for them to find the motivation. And so it's not necessarily that negative or extrinsic are bad. We just have to be really careful about when, where, and why we use them. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an example that, that Yukai Chow talks about that, you know, if someone plays music and it's just for fun, that's really this intrinsic thing, this accomplishment, and they like doing it. And, you know, they, they like thinking of themselves as a musician and, you know, all these kinds of things. As soon as you start paying them, you're shifting it to be an extrinsic motivator. And so if you start paying someone to do something they love, and then you slowly take away that money over time, they might come to a place where they lose both the extrinsic and the intrinsic motivation. So there's some really interesting tensions between all these work. 
And so this is an example with this um, framework, the way there's sort of this eight layers, you can go deeper into sort of the subcategories, but there's also this like top level thing of, of, of sort of how to, how to think about them and navigate them. And we can uh, use this sort of spider graph, this radar graph as a way to think about different examples. So for instance, in Farmville, you get a lot of uh, accomplishment and ownership, right? Cause you're making your farm and you're planting crops and you're doing all these kinds of things. There's a lot of uh, 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 opportunity costs that you wanna think about with the countdown timers, but there's not a lot of unpredictability, right? You know, you know that there's always gonna be the next crop or the next thing you have to kind of save up for. And there's not a lot of meaning. And so you might have folks that play this game for a long time, but then eventually Eventually they get to this point and they're like, well, so what, you know, what is, what, what's the, you know, what's the bigger thing that I'm contributing to? It doesn't really have that. And by contrast, something like Candy Crush might be a little more balanced and it's, it's sort of operating on a few different of these sort of kind of areas and what those examples are. And of course, this isn't just about video games, products <coughs> of all kinds, you know, um, uh, play into this. So for instance, Facebook, um, I like this example that Yukai Chao developed with Facebook because originally there was a scarcity element. You know, you were only at Harvard or only people with a .edu email. And now it's open to, you know, the goal is to make it available to everyone. So it went from something that had a lot of scarcity to now very little scarcity. And, um, you know, all the other sort of different mechanics that go into what that Facebook experience it is. So you can actually go to Yukai's website and play around with sliders and sort of take a, a product you're working on or a product that you like and sort of try and figure out what, what this might look for them. And of course, um, we can add some more nuance, which I think is really exciting. So there's a, you know, the, 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 the gaming uh, mechanics that we might want to layer on in the discovery or the onboarding phase would look very different for sort of a more a mature user with that product. And then we can also sort of start talking about different kinds of user types. So there's these, these, these uh, strata that, that the Yukai Cho imports from, from um, other thinkers, sort of thinking that, you know, there are those folks that, you know, when they're playing a video game, they want to get every single side quest and mission and they want to do all that kind of work. You know, and there's other folks that when they're video gaming, it's for very social meetings. You know, they want to connect with people. They want to, you know, do all the chat and the fun and the collaborative kind of things. So you can think about, you know, who are the folks that you're really trying to reach with your product, with your experience? And then how do we sort of cater to them at different phases? And so I love the, you know, compared to sort of just coming up with some badges, this allows us to get to a much deeper, more nuanced conversation conversation about the different ways that we can help people achieve the goals that they want to, whether it's fitness or health or education or, or whatever it is within the product. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the point here. You know, what are the levers that we can play with to help folks accomplish the things that they want to do? Um, so in the handout, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, there's some links to the Yukai Chao uh, 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 website where he has a lot of this information. There's a bonus framework that I think dovetails really well this, which is uh, Nir Eyal's Hooked model. Now, full disclosure, I work for Udemy. Both of these people have Udemy courses. I'm not saying that you should take them there, but it is an option. And of course, that you can buy their books on Amazon. You can go to their websites. They have other uh, formats. So there's a lot of different ways you can engage with that content. So just to sort of be above board. So that's an example of how a framework might help us think a little deeper at the product level. But there's other levels we have to think about. And so another one might be how we're operating as a company or as an organization. And so where do we go from there? And, you know, it's almost a cliche now, right? This sort of idea of um, uh, is technology leading us to a utopia or a dystopia? You know, what are the dangers? We've, we've seen all this with the different elections and, you know, all these other sort of different factors that, that technology has real world impacts and not everything about it is good. And there are malicious actors out there, but much of the negative impact comes from people just like us. The decisions that we've made lead to these negative things. So, um, the next framework here, ethicalos.org. So this is called the Ethical Operating System. And so what they've done is they've uh, articulated these eight different risk zones that organizations need to think about. And so I think a lot of times uh, we in the UX world think about sort of this from the dark patterns perspective, but there's some bigger questions that we need to also be thinking about. So I'm just going to read through these really quickly. Risk zone one, truth, disinformation, and propaganda. Risk zone two, addiction and the dopamine economy. Risk zone three, economic and asset inequalities. Risk zone four, machine ethics and algorithmic biases. Risk zone five, the surveillance state. Risk zone six, data control and monetization. Risk zone seven, implicit trust and user understanding. Risk zone eight, hateful and criminal actors. And so again, by having this taxonomy, we don't just be like, hey, there, there's something about our business model that doesn't set right with me. You can say, hey, I think that this decision that we're doing is really leading us into risk zone two 
and risk zone four. And I also really like that these are articulated as risk zones because it's really easy to kind of drift into these things. It's oftentimes not that someone sets out and says, hey, I want to take advantage of economic and asset inequalities. It's a lot of little decisions that lead to that. And those are both reflected in terms of the, the, the operational decisions, the user experience decisions, the interaction decisions. They all kind of add up and can lead us into some of these places. And so the, the way they talk about the ethical OS is a guide to anticipating the future impact of today's technology. And so for me, a, another way to put this is how not to regret the things that we build. You know, imagine these case studies that we've heard of, 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 of uh, products and companies that are doing things that are sort of now case studies of unethical technology. You know, imagine being someone who worked on that and being like, wow, you know, I wish I could have foreseen this. I wish I could have stood up stronger. I wish I could have sort of been part of the conversation to think about some of these considerations. So it's pretty non-controversial, I hope, um, that we need to sort of have this level of ethics and responsibility. But like I said before, it's easy to talk yourself into a risk zone. There's even some research that the more creative and intelligent you are, the easier it is to do unethical behavior. A lot of times, the way you do unethical behavior is by coming up with a creative explanation, sort of talking yourself into rationalizing why something is okay. And so if you're in the UX world, chances are you're really smart and you're really creative. So in, in, in some senses, we are the most at risk for falling into this trap. And so we have to be the most vigilant for standing up and, and being aware of these considerations. Um, and like I said, there's always a danger of sort of drifting into these risk zones by a bunch of little small decisions. So what does the Ethical OS have? That's a bunch of great resources. It has these you know, articulations of the risk zones and what they are and examples and sort of case studies and further reading that you can go into them. They have these different strategies and, and different ways of thinking about it, which are fun. So you know, a Hippocratic Oath for data workers, what would that look like you know, if, we're, if we're doing any kind of research? We're collecting data, uh, oftentimes sensitive data, important data about people's lives. What are our responsibilities for that? The same way that a doctor has responsibilities for doing no harm and things like that. Um, if there was a license to design, you know, what would that look like? You know, we, we have such power working for these technology companies, um, you know, um, and it's kind of an unregulated thing. If we were to regulate it, what would it look like? These are great uh, thought experiments to sort of go through and consider uh, and to reflect on for our own practices. So you can almost think about this as like a, a, these hypotheticals and checklists as an ethical heuristic review. And we're in the UX world, so we love heuristic reviews. You know, it's a great resource to sort of be able to have. And in the same way, the heuristic review allows you to kind of take a step back and think about the experiences that you're designing. This does too, but just from a different perspective. Um, and also it can be a really important if you say, hey, I think my organization is making some bad decisions or we've drifted into the risk zone. It's one thing for you just kind of to plop down and be like, hey, I think there's some problems here. It's another thing for you to just be like, hey, some really smart people put through this risk, this, this, this taxonomy. And here's why I think we're falling into risk zone seven and two or, or whatever it might be. So it gives you some, some uh, standing on which to sort of make these cases. So that's one. So another big part of what we do, moving on to the next framework, is thinking about feedback. And feedback is so critical. And just in, in life, it's this is a, a great example of where human-centered de design also just sort of gives you great life lessons. And feedback is fuel. That's an organizational thing that Udemy really believes in. And there's some variations on this, but hopefully your organization has something similar. But I think we also need to think about that there's different kinds of fuel. Um, and you know, there's this classic thing that sort of gets presented. Sometimes it's a little gendered, but I think it's true for everybody that sometimes when, when someone's looking for um, help or brings you a problem, they're looking for advice. And sometimes they're looking to vent. You know, sometimes they're looking for you to help them work the problem. Sometimes they're looking for you to be a sounding board or just give emotional support. And so, you know, we're starting to think about, you know, there's different kinds of feedback that people might be thinking, and we can take this even further. So here's the next framework. And this is something um, I, I, I'm taking from Spotify. And for them, it's called the coaching stance matrix. And so this is really great because there's two axes. And one of them is the readiness to discuss. So, so the, the vertical axis. So you know, how ready is someone to sort of to talk about what they're working on or their problems or their issues or the challenges? And then the other axis here is the consequence of failure. So if something doesn't turn out right, what are the what's going to happen because of that? And so that we can start filling in this, this sort of matrix and coming up with some interesting sort of things. So for instance, someone who has a relatively um, high readiness to discuss, right? They're super excited about something and they really want people to sort of tell them about what's going on and how they can do better. And the consequence of failure is relatively low. That's what we might call coaching. We can sort of be like, go out there, give it a shot, see what happens. And then we can sort of workshop it afterwards. We can sort of in the sports world, you know, we can watch the game film after the game and sort of see what worked and what didn't. 
There's other times where you might not have that same readiness to discuss. And so that might fall into sort of chit chat, right? So relatively low consequence of failure. This might be something like very early in a project, but you know, maybe someone's just starting to kind of understand the problem space and you know, they're you know, not quite ready to talk about it in the same way. That's when it's kind of more like, hey, I'm just kind of a sounding board or let's just kind of chat about it. Or you, know, you might sort of be like, hey, you know who else in the, in the company you know, has done some interesting work in a similar space? You might want to go sort of, you know, sort of see what some of their uh, you know, prototypes or like or something like that. Now, there are instances where the consequence of failure gets higher, and we have to be ready to acknowledge that. So in a case where that, that consequence of failure is much higher, but maybe someone you know, is, is dealing with a lot of things, or there's a tight deadline, or you know, sort of things, and the readiness to discuss is still pretty low, that's a case where you know, the manager or the, or the lead really needs to be setting expectations. Like, you know, we need to make sure that we do this for mobile and desktop, and it needs to have these components. And if you don't know how to do something, you know, I'm really going to step in and help you understand you know, how to do this or how to sort of design for this use case or consider accessibility or you know, whatever that might be. As we start to move up that, that, that uh, readiness to discuss um, access, you know, we get to maybe uh, mentoring or maybe more sharing expectations rather than setting expectations. And then maybe more towards that upper right-hand feed uh, quarter when there's a really high readiness to discuss and also a high consequence of failure, we're able to sort of be in this more pure feedback kind of mode. And this is so powerful because we're able to make these distinctions and modify the relationship that we're getting from the feedback in different ways, depending on the situation. And so there's a bunch of things I like about it. One, you know, we often focus on skill level rather than context. And, you know, I think that you can have uh, very experienced people and very junior people that fall on different parts of this uh, map at different parts in the same, you know, month or year. And so it's not just about sort of how experienced someone is, but sort of this, these other factors in terms of thinking about the kinds of feedback and the kinds of way we're, we're, we're giving folks that feedback. Um, and that there's a lot of factors that can impact readiness to discuss. You know, uh, we're going through a pandemic. You know, some people are having hard challenges with, with childcare or paying the rent or, you know, all these other kinds of things. You know, they might not be in a place where they're really ready for this sort of coaching and feedback, uh, or maybe they're working on a project that's just had a beset with different sort of technical problems and sort of things like that. So it's an example of um, uh, uh, acknowledging that, you know, we're at different sort of places with that. Um, and then also acknowledging that, you know, a lot of times we sort of talk about failing fast or taking big swings or sort of things like that. And that's great. It's such an important part of how we grow is to be able to do all these kind of things. But we also have to acknowledge that there are moments when the consequence of failure is really high. And just sort of being very honest and open about that, um, rather than sort of acting like we can always take really big swings and you know, there's never sort of a, a downside to that. So we can, again, modulate what we're doing a little more accurately. Um, and one thing I've noticed in some organizations is that people can feel both micromanaged and sort of not managed or not given enough guidance at the same time. And so I think that this matrix helps to sort of explain why that could happen. You know, you're out of sync as to the kinds of feedback you're looking for in different situations. Um, another thing I like about this is some of this feels kind of obvious in retrospect, but I think a lot of the really framework, the really great and useful frameworks do. They help to articulate something that we all kind of know, but it really kind of locks it down and makes it really clear. And there's, a, there's actually a lot of value in that. So, um, you know, I'll just leave you with a few thoughts as I move on to the next framework of, you know, um, whenever we think of a framework, think about how you would modify it or what you would change, you know, would you add another dimension? What are some of the other things? If we wanted to apply a human centered design to coaching, you know, how would you we use this matrix? What are some of the other things we might sort of incorporate into it? Um, is this something that we might want to bring into design reviews? You know, a place where we're really trying to give feedback. It's the staple of what we're doing and sort of thinking through it in, in some of those kind of lenses. Cool. So the fourth frame, uh, framework is thinking about teams and organizations of UXers. So one thing just to get out there, um, we have a bias towards wanting to hire people like ourselves. And that goes beyond everything. It includes gender and ethnicity. It includes training and experience and background. You know, we're a very interdisciplinary field. And so I've seen, you know, maybe folks who were really strong in graphic design before they became a UX designer, they will naturally have a bias to hiring other UXers who have a similar sort of strength in graphic design. Whereas, you know, maybe folks coming from a different background will have a bias towards that. There's another area we have a bias on and that's sort of the disposition. And when I talk about disposition here, it's sort of a, a, an umbrella term for thinking about, you know, how people deal with uncertainty and how much they sort of need things to be really certain before they can move forward or, or 
it's, you know, some folks kind of like the, the chaos. Uh, how well we do we deal with risk? You know, some projects inherently have more risk and variability. Um, the amount of process, you know, some people feel really suffocated by process. And if you're, they're working in an org where everything is super, super, super process, you know, they're going to not like it. Other folks, they really need that process. It's a big part of sort of how they think about their, their methods and, and sort of moving forward. And then also sort of, you know, what motivates you? Uh, do you really like constantly jumping from new thing to new thing? Do you really like getting deep into the weeds? Um, in terms of collaboration, do you really love working with, you know, 18 million different stakeholders and, and, and uh, three other designers? Or do you kind of like uh, running off and sort of working on your own and, and sort of coming back with sort of the, the thing? And then the different, all the different kinds of complexity of the different experiences that we work on. So, you know, I think we all have sort of biases in, in all of these kinds of things. And so when we're thinking about organizations, there's, there's a few different ways of thinking about this. You know, there's sort of the classic uh, one, there's a few different versions of this, but the UX maturity. So, you know, um, some folks really love working and being sort of the first UXer and in that sort of zero to one quantum leap of, of really introducing uh, human-centered design and processes and user feedback and all those kind of things. And then, you know, there's all the way to sort of very sort of self-actualized and very user-centered companies. You know, different folks are gonna work at different places. Uh, similarly on sort of that planning thing, you know, if you're working at a two person startup, everything is kind of probably going to be very ad hoc, right? You're just jumping from one thing to the next. And it's all sort of very spontaneous. Um, you know, if you're working for a really big tech company, it's going to work very differently. So there's sort of different things there. So that's one way of looking at organizations, you know, sorry, two different lenses for looking at organizations. So if we're to somehow like overlay who we are as people, and the organizations we're looking at, you know, is there a way of sort of aligning those? And so that's what the next framework is really about. And so there's a lot of factors to consider, but sort of here's one. And this is sort of thinking about different archetypes um, that we might have of, of folks working in the UX world or, or really any role. And so the first archetype is the maverick. And so this is someone, you know, they, they, they want very little process. They kind of want to run out and do their own thing. They love solving problems and jumping from one thing and taking really big swings and, you know, thrive on the chaos and, you know, really always want to be doing sort of the cutting edge and the new thing. In the middle, we might have someone we call the architect. And so this is someone that's really invested in, you know, how do we scale impact? You know, this might be someone who's really uh, thinking about bringing in a design system, or, you know, this is someone that's saying, I really like working on designs, but I also really want to make sure that when I hand those to an engineer, they're getting implemented in the way that I design them. So what is that handoff process? You know, what are the red lines? What are the blue lines? You know, all the different things that we're working on. That might be someone sort of in the architect side. And then the guardian might be someone saying, you know, hey, you know, we have this very, you know, mature experience. You know, how do we sort of evolve things? How do I really protect the user and shield them from the chaos sometimes of, of the sort of the whole process going on at the company and sort of lead things on in the right kind of way? Now, what's really important to think about with this is none of these are better than another one. Um, it's really, you know, I think sort of design Twitter and sort of your, your, your design hot takes, you know, tend to gravitate towards really valorizing the maverick, you know, the sort of the, this is sort of the, the cool designer and the black turtleneck sort of doing the, the kind of rebellious work and everything like that. And those people are super valuable, but it's not the only way to be a designer. And it's not the only way to contribute to doing really meaningful and important design work. And so now let's start thinking about how this works with different organizations. So if you were to work on, let's say one of the big FANG, you know, big tech companies, and you know, you're working on a product that is used by 2 billion people a day, you know, would you want to hire, a, if your team was five uh, designers, would you want to hire five Mavericks? Well, you know, probably not, you know, there's going to be a, a bit of a misalignment there. Similarly, if it's a brand new startup and the whole uh, design team has two designers, you might not want to hire two guardians. But I think there's also a danger here because I think that there's a danger that the startup only hires the Mavericks and that big mature company only hires the guardian. And especially once you start getting slightly larger design teams, you know, five, six, 20, 100, you know, you start having to think about having the right mix because in an ideal world, these three different archetypes are very complementary. You know, how are you going to keep that big mature product fresh? You need to have some of that maverick thinking injected into that process, but it needs to be done the right way. If none of the incentive structures are there, if there's no um, praise given to trying 300 things and only one of them working, that maverick is going to get really frustrated and quit and sort of try and find another opportunity. And similarly, if you're at a mid-sized startup, 
you know, you have to be able to find a way to sort of start bringing in a guardian or bringing in the architect or whatever it is. So, you know, you need to make sure that the incentive structures are there to have the right balance. And, and you know, maybe you over index a little on one of these types, depending on where you are and where your company is and the maturity and all that kind of stuff. But it's always good to have those sort of dissenting perspectives and those other kinds of things, because they can really, you know, invigorate and make everything work better together. So um, a few things to keep in mind with this framework, uh, and this is for individuals. You know, we aren't all one thing, and you know, we can be different things in our different points in our career, and that's okay. And that none of these are better, right? So if if you see one of your uh, coworkers and they're really a really awesome architect, you know, that doesn't mean you need to be an architect to be awesome too. You can find your own way in sort of this kind of matrix. But organizations need to keep things in mind. Like I said, you know, what's the right mix of things? Um, none of these are better. Um, uh, from an organizational perspective either. And um, like I said before, be careful of what you're incentivizing. And, and this doesn't replace other diversity, equity, and inclusion factors. You know, we still need to think about, you know, being diverse in terms of, uh, you know, gender and ethnicity and all these kinds of things. It's yet another way to think about sort of diversity. Um, so yeah, I really encourage you, whether you're part of the hiring committee or the hiring manager, don't hire people just like you, you know, and, and just, just don't do it. You know, it's really going to make your design team better if you're able to incorporate as much diversity as possible. So when you're thinking about these architects, you know, if you were to design a, um, the, the, the design team or the research team at all these different kinds of organizations, you know, it's just kind of a mental exercise thinking about, um, you know, if this is a, you know, um, uh, what would the mix be that you would pick? And so uh, I want to give credit to Wesley Yoon and, and Brian Conan who came up with this, um, which I I think it's just been kind of revelatory for me when I'm thinking about how teams come together and can be complementary. So here's the fifth and, and the final of these um, uh, frameworks. And that's the Sudoto, which is see one, do one, teach one, or put otherwise, learn it, apply it, and share it. And this is actually something that uh, I've come across uh, uh, that's really prominent in the medical community. So if you're learning a procedure, like a surgical procedure, the, the idea is that you don't actually know how to do that procedure until you see it, you do it, and you teach it, and then you sort of follow this progression. So a lot of times the way this works is, you know, you might start off and you've seen it all the, you know, the TV medical shows, there's sort of the gallery of people up there. And that's sort of the first step of see it, you know, you're maybe looking down and kind of observing. And then the next step is maybe you're on the floor and kind of peering around people's shoulders. And then as you can see in this picture, you know, a lot of these procedures need multiple sets of hands. So you're doing the retracting, you're holding the light. And that kind of allows you to slowly evolve from the seeing one to doing one. And then finally being on the other side and teaching one. And it's such a great way of thinking about how we build our skills and how we build our abilities. And it's actually a problem in the medical field right now because with the advent of robotic surgery, a lot of times now you don't need that extra set of hands. And it's creating a real training problem because um, the jump from sort of seeing one to doing one has started to get really big and there's less opportunities to teach one because you don't have to teach that second set of hands that it's created a real problem in, in, the, in the world of surgeons. So hopefully we can learn sort of from old school surgery. And I think a real big emphasis for me here is that it's not a one-way street. This isn't just about developing folks by letting them observe and letting them sort of do it, but the act of teaching is actually incredibly powerful for us getting better at our craft and, and, and developing there. Um, so the see one, do one, teach one helps us to break out of our uh, silos. You know, a lot of times the, the, the work that we do as researchers, as designers, there's a lot of different components about it. And so we get to see how other folks do things. It, it allows for more collaboration. And, and it just allows us to sort of overall develop the capacity of ourselves and our teams. Um, and again, coming back to this concept of feedback, it creates opportunities for feedback. You can't just say feedback is important. You need to create a culture. Um, for this to sort of happen. And that's why design reviews are so powerful, right? It creates this sort of ritualistic moment for feedback. And the see one, do one, teach one is also another opportunity to allow folks to do feedback. And, you know, feedback isn't just valuable for the person receiving it, but articulating feedback, again, really helps you get better at your craft. I used to be a really, really poor writer. And the way, the single thing that made my writing uh, better was as a teacher having to grade papers. Um, you know, you can't just be like, this is bad. You have to say this is bad because of X, Y, and Z. And this is what you would do differently. And, and then you start recognizing that maybe you do some of those things. So, you know, this is where it can be really powerful. 
Um, and um, this is also another reason why hiring junior folks is, is really important. I've seen some organizations that are really focusing on mid to senior, mid to senior, mid to senior. And I think that you know this, this allows you to inject some fresh perspectives that maybe have different skills and allow some of those mid to senior folks to do some of this mentoring um, and develop their own skills in, in really important ways. And I think uh, another call for sort of having real balanced teams. Um, and like I said before, kind of builds on the overall design review culture. So, um, you know, uh, uh, my challenge to you is if this is something that you're interested in, where would you bring it into your organization? You know, what haven't you ever had the opportunity to teach? Uh, you know, it sounds like the, the next talk is going to be on icon design. Maybe you've done a ton of icon design and other people in your organization haven't. Is this an opportunity for you to get even better icon design by teaching other folks? Um, and then, you know, taking that step back and thinking, you know, is teaching part of the UX culture? And I'm a big believer uh, that it should be. Okay. So we've gone through these five frameworks and, you know, went through them really fast, but hopefully it started to get you thinking about how we organize information, how we organize the relationships between things and how that can sort of allow us to, to, to be better at our work and build better teams and better products and all these kind of things. So this is my challenge to you is to, to make your own. Um, and, you know, this can help with both big, difficult, persistent challenges. And just if you're kind of noodling on something and, and thinking about your own thoughts or product insights, uh, whenever a researcher on my team kind of does a report and everything seemed kind of paint by numbers, kind of self-explanatory, a lot of times I challenge them, say, try and make a framework of what you heard in this research and see if we can draw out some different kind of relationship or a different kind of insight. Um, writing and formulating frameworks makes your own thinking clearer. So if you're thinking about two different design approaches, well, see if you could take a step back and, and what's the framework you're trying to approach as to why one or why the other, and it can help you to get a little more clear and maybe even make them more divergent in terms of the, the two different um, approaches that you're exploring. Um, and it's really useful for communicating uh, strategic planning. And this is an area that I think a lot of UXers, whether they're researchers or designers or hybrids, you know, sort of sometimes complain that they don't they, you know, have enough say or don't have enough input in terms of the strategic planning for the organization. Now, if you come up with a really powerful framework about how your business model works or about your user types or something like that, and that becomes part of the, the way the organization talks about what it is that they're doing, it's going to have such a big impact on the, the, the trajectory and the strategic planning. So there's a really big opportunity if you can sort of get the input. And so I encourage you to take a human-centered design approach. You got to experiment and iterate. It's never going to come out perfect, you know, right away. Take an existing framework and modify it. It's a great opportunity to sketch and noodle and doodle and, and all that kind of good stuff. Make it collaborative. The act of uh, making the framework can be immensely valuable and, and lead to better work, but bring in other perspectives and sort of put it all together. And you know, fundamentals right here. What problem are you serving? What value are you creating or trying to do with this framework? Uh, again, a lot of these uh, sort of um, human-centered design philosophy, uh, philosophy uh, tenets apply to so much of what we do. And look broadly. Um, when we want to bring in frameworks, it doesn't always have to be something you've come uh, created sort of out of thin air, but a lot of times you can incorporate ideas from other things. I've been sort of uh, having this idea about how uh, um, insights for an organization are kind of like nutrients for uh, microorganisms. So um, sort of been sort of trying to think about how I can develop that as an, as an idea. So there's different kinds of frameworks and I just kind of want to talk through these really quickly. So there's the spectrum, right? We can sort of talk about there's this side, there's this side and the sort of midpoint. So this is, you know, talking about the archetype of the, of the maverick and the, and the guardian and things like that. So that's one uh, kind of um, thing that you could develop. Another one is a hierarchy. You know, we all probably heard about Maslow's hierarchy of needs where, you know, first you kind of need a shell of food and then you need shelter and it kind of builds from there. So, you know, you kind of build and build value on things. So here's an example from uh, Gartner talking about the, uh, customer experience pyramid. Um, the classic Venn diagram is also super useful. So, you know, understanding um, how, what applies to what and what's shared and what isn't shared between a bunch of things. It's another framework uh, that you can use. Another one is a, a hierarchy or a taxonomy uh, that again, sort of, uh, uh, you know, puts things in sort of these different kinds of relationships. And then uh, another one that I've already referenced is that two by two. So I'm going to have sort of two axes and plot things around them. And, and fundamentally, all these express different types of relationships between things and allows us to sort of narrow our focus of the things that we're considering. 
So if this is a little new to you, um, I'm a big fan of starting with that two by two framework. It's, it's tried and true for a reason. Um, and like any product, you're gonna have to experiment and play around with it. And the real key here is, is what are the two dimensions you're gonna pick and why? So I'm just gonna sort of mention a few. So, you know, here's one, if you're thinking about the distance and the price for food and sort of thinking about what those are, you know, if something's far and expensive, that's the fancy restaurant in the big city. If it's something's close and cheap, that's the local fast food joint. So you're already starting to organize things. Um, I love this one. You know, if we're talking about fruit, you know, we could organize them in so many different ways by color, by size, but those actually might not be that useful. Whereas if we're talking about sort of the difficulty of eating and the tastiness and sort of plot it out that way, we might come to some different conclusions about what's similar and what's different and what are the relationships between things. And then this last one is a little bit of a joke. It's sort of talking about baklava and um, sort of you move in one direction, you get more pistachios, you move in another direction, you get more walnuts. And, but you know, it sort of is that same idea that you have these two axes. So suggestions, if you're gonna start exploring some, some two by twos, uh, don't pick two features that strongly, uh, co uh, uh, strongly correlate. So if, if folks that like your product um, uh, stick around for a long time, you wouldn't wanna put, you know, tenure and satisfaction, because you're basically just going to map everything very linearly. Um, and um, also sort of think about the midpoint. So for each of the dimensions, is the middle zero? Is the middle halfway? Or are they sort of different categories of things? And sometimes playing around with that, you can sort of, it'll influence how you sort of end up putting everything. And then I'm also a big fan of labeling the quadrants. So there's sort of the, the superficial level of labeling the axes, but then if you can actually label the four quadrants, it can also help to sort of tease out sort of some of the, the deeper insights here. So for instance, with the one I have here, if something's both a new product, but a, um, uh, sorry, a new product uh, in a current moda, uh, market, that's something that would be uh, investing there would be product development. Whereas a new product with a new market, that's diversification. And so by labeling these things, even if you have sort of small points within them, you can sort of start to dis discern these kind of trends. And again, to this idea of making your own, you know, you, you, you develop this mental model and you kind of go through this, this sort of system um, and, and you don't want to just kind of sit there. So this is what we call double loop learning. And it's that, that one little subtle difference that you see where now you want, you know, as you're executing this and putting it out there in the real world, it comes back and it fundamentally changes that framework that you're working on. So it allows you to keep evolving it um, because the, the context and the situation and the data and all those kind of things will, will change with you too. Okay. So this is my last little section here. Uh, I know we're probably getting right up against time here, but um, you have a killer framework. You've done all the things I talked about. You, you did it collaboratively, you iterated on it, but what's next? It's just sitting on your computer. It's not gonna have all that much value. So we have to think about how to make it valuable and we need to share and we need to amplify. So first thing I encourage you to do is do a little internal marketing. You know, sometimes just a little design flair, give it a fun name, invest in the look and feel, you know, think about how you're putting it out there and presenting it. It can really help it to get traction and, 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 and spark a discussion. And when something sparks a discussion, that almost always means that it's, it's creating some value out there. Uh, meet people where they are. You know, this is one thing I really love about the Octalysis framework is there's sort of a very basic eight level, you know, eight sort of sections, or you can go deeper or you can sort of map on this higher thing. So think about the right levels of complexity. You don't want to overwhelm people right from the start, but um, you can sort of meet people where they are and let them go as deep as they need uh, for however useful it may or may not be for them. And you're gonna to have to nurture adoption. So you worked on this really hard, it's your baby, you kind of wanna put it out in the world, but it might not get traction just instantly. So think about the repetition. You're gonna to have to talk about it in the design review. You're gonna to have to share it on Slack. You're gonna to have to bring it up at different points. And that's okay, you know, a little repetition, keep it fresh, get people comfortable with it. You know, let people sort of internalize it. That's when it becomes useful and figure out how you can sort of make it durable for the organization. And then just really quickly, there are some limitations. So frameworks are a basis for increasing understanding and making communication effective, but they can also sort of lead us to some surface level thinking. So we need to think about, you know, uh, that as a risk. Um, and, you know, uh, is the framework the work itself or is it a teaser or an invitation to get people into a deeper set of ideas? You know, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. 
And similarly, sometimes you can get lost in frameworks. So again, here's that double diamond. It's got these four really elegant phases. Now, this isn't the entirety of what we do, right? This is an abstraction that takes a lot of different complex things and summarizes them into these four phases. Um, I saw online, someone had done this really interesting work where they had uh, tried to, you know, add all these extra sort of components and, and sort of uh, blow out the, the double diamond. Now, undoubtedly, this was super useful for that individual, right? Them going through this process, they really understand, you know, what they're doing and what they're trying to do and things like that. But, you know, if this had been the original double diamond that had sort of been put out into the world, I don't think it would ever would have had the same salience. And, and maybe this doesn't apply to, it doesn't have the same level of universality because it starts to get more specific. So, you know, you, there, you can go sort of too far in these kinds of things as well. So again, another call to iterate and approach this from a very human-centered design perspective. So um, I just threw a lot at folks, but um, would love to see if there's any questions. Hey, Leif, thanks so much. That was, that was awesome. Uh, we got some good questions. We got some some sort of uh, um, like meta questions, questions about frameworks, and then also some like specific questions about some of the stuff you talked about. So uh, not too late to get your questions in either. Uh, there's a q and I think it's on the bottom. It's on the bottom for me. I hope it's the same for you. Uh, you can open that up and throw your question in, and then uh, we'll get to it. Um, but I have the first one here, um, and the question is, what are the dangers of frameworks, and how do you avoid them? For instance, how do you prevent them from becoming dogma? Yeah, and I think that that's where that, that double loop is so important. You know, you can't just sort of take something that was developed, you know, and here's a, here's a classic example, right? The, the uh, uh, Nielsen Norman, you know, heuristics, right? They're, everyone sort of knows them. They sort of come out. We sort of talk about these, these the heuristics for interfaces. You know, those were done when a lot of the work that, that, that we were doing in this field was for enterprise solutions. There's very little consumer sort of technology. They're, they don't really take into account mobile. And so I think that's an example where as awesome as they are and, and foundational and fundamental and valuable, in a way they've kind of become dogma. And um, I've looked along, there's, there've been some alternatives sort of proposed that have sort of been updated, but that'd be a case where maybe we need to challenge those and sort of come up with a, a 2020 version of the heuristic review, which you know probably won't apply in 2040 and won't apply in 2060. So I think it is good to always be thinking about that and, and that we can go too far into the weeds or too down the, the rabbit hole and um, you know really just make sure you have that, that, that second double loop to, to keep things uh, fresh and relevant and, and not dogmatic. Awesome. Um, so another question is a little bit of a, a two-parter. One is, have you encountered any frameworks that haven't worked well? And then a second part is, how do you pick a good framework from one that is maybe just you know a bunch of BS or something that shouldn't be taken seriously? Yeah, and this is where I think some of that like really deep work is important. I'll maybe uh, address the second one where, you know, let's say something and, and you think it kind of has some promise and it's maybe something you developed or maybe it's something that someone else developed that you sort of came into contact with. And I think this is where like, playing with it, you know, and, um, you know, and, and to designers, I really encourage folks to not just design on the computer, right, you know, get out the pen and the pencil and noodle and, 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 you know, do all that kind of stuff. And I think this is a great example, you know, play around with the, the framework and label things and draw arrows and, you know, and, and I think if it's, if it's sparking ideas, if it's sparking things, that's great. If, if you just kind of feel overwhelmed and you don't really know what to do with it and you don't know how to annotate it and you don't know how to start, you know, elaborating on it or modifying it or, you know, things like that, that might tell you that there's, you know, it's maybe not necessarily that the framework is bad, but maybe it's just not the right one for what it is. You know, there, there needs to be an, a, a fit, you know, sort of question as well here. Um, what was the first part of the question? I think I, I missed that part of it. Have you encountered any frameworks that didn't work very well? Like, have you tried any of them on and you decided, nope, that one's not for me? Yeah, I'm having trouble thinking of one specifically off the top of my head, but there's definitely been ones that either I've come up with in reports and like totally fell flat and didn't go anywhere, or, um, you know, that, that I got kind of excited about. And when I really, you know, got into the weeds of it, I was like, oh, you know, maybe it's actually not that useful. So it definitely does happen. Cool. Uh, another question. Do you use these frameworks for user excuse me, <clears throat> user research planning meetings or other meetings with project stakeholders? If so, can you provide a quick example? 
Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a classic example of, you know, who do we include as the sample? You know, who are we talking to? Are they new users? Are they old users? You know, current users, are they churned users? Are these folks that are, um, you know, uh, you know, have been with us in a long time or new users? Are these folks in certain markets? Are, are we getting, you know, all the different sort of dimensions that can make people who they are, you know, you can sort of plot that out. And we were even uh, experimenting uh, with my research team at Udemy is doing sort of a retro at the end of the year and sort of maybe making a framework and sort of figuring out like, oh, we've actually, you know, 80% of the people we talked to this year were current users. You know, is that good? Is that bad? You know, 90% of the people we talked to were outside of the United States. Is that good? Is that bad? You know, the ramifications of that. So I think it can definitely be useful. Um, and then um, also um, from a, a process or procedure perspective, you know, um, if you're trying to um, make sure that researchers are doing all the things that we need to do, you know, signing NDAs, um, you know, paying uh, uh, participants the incentive properly, you know, that's where a lot of sort of process frameworks can be really important. And that's really valuable. You know, let's say a PM says, oh, you know, all the researchers are busy, but I want to do a little ad hoc user research. Being able to sort of hand them some of those uh, process frameworks can be really helpful for empowering them to do that kind of work. Awesome. Uh, so Rob says, Leif, thank you. Amazing subject. Uh, and then asks, would you lean towards any of these frameworks for a new UX, for new UX practitioners? Yeah, um, I think getting into some of that 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 gamification stuff, the the near IAL and the Yukai Chow, um, uh, they're both just great communicators too. It's sort of uh, learning about product design from people who don't call themselves product designers, and learning about you know human behavior from a sort of different source of things over the different perspective. Um, they just have both a lot of very approachable, really valuable information. So I think that, that that's one place where I'd start. Now, if you're a, a little more uh, a junior in your career, you know, the first parts of what you're doing are probably going to be a little more focused on sort of designing products and experiences. So I'd start there. Awesome. Uh, and this one is about the, the Spotify coaching matrix. Um, and the question is, is that something that a coach would use or something that, or something that somebody who is being coached would use, or could they use it together somehow? I, lo I love that. And it's actually something in the speaker notes that I, I forgot to get to. So I'm glad this got brought up. I, I think this is a great, great example. We're having that shared understanding. And, you know, you see this with couples where, you know, maybe someone wants to vent and the other per pro person is problem solving. And so the person says, hey, actually, right now, I just need to vent. Let's problem solve later. And I think it's a, it's a very similar thing when thinking about your manager. You can be like, hey, this is actually a new project for me. I'm still getting my head around it. Can we kind of do this as chit chat? rather than as, you know, coaching or, you know, whatever it might be. So, yeah, I think it is really good. And it's something, you know, I've talked to with at least a couple of the folks on my team and, and sort of used it as a reference point and sort of things like that. So um, if you're not getting the kind of feedback that you need, this could be a great thing to bring to your manager. And if you're maybe a new manager or even an experienced manager, you know, it could be something to bring to your team as well. So I think it's, it can be all of the above. That's, that's really cool. Just a follow up thought. I feel like at certain points in my career, if I would have had that framework, I probably could have communicated with like my manager better when I wasn't feeling supported, just like you said. Uh, that one stuck out to me too. It's just like a really powerful one. I mean, for everything, right? It's not just for design, it's just for life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it was like the Spotify Eng team that came up with it, but I just thought it was super useful. So yeah, same with me. I was like, I wish I'd seen this 10 years ago. <laughs> That's super cool. Uh, okay, so Christopher asks, have you ever been in a situation to challenge frameworks that are deeply ingrained into a company culture? If so, how did you suggest new norms? Yeah, um, I think you gotta be careful. Um, I think it's, it is important though, because I think sometimes, especially if you're in a company that's rapidly evolving or scaling or, or approaching new markets, you can get really overly fixated on, on one way of thinking. So one of the companies I was, I was at had a very sort of um, inflexible way of sort of defining different user types and, and sort of what that was based on. And so um, fortunately, you know, as a user researcher, I can sort of start bringing in some contrary data and sort of doing it slowly. Um, and then some of it was also, I think one way it's a little like a judo move. You say, hey, let's evolve this. And, you know, sort of that can be a way to sort of, you know, uh, sort of get, uh, think about it. But, you know, if the person that originally came up with that framework is still very attached to it and still at that company, and if they're still very senior, you know, you definitely have to sort of think about some of the politics and be very diplomatic and kind of things like that, depending on sort of their approach. So, um, you know, there's definitely some, some sort of complexity there, but um, I think it's also, once you start seeing frameworks, you start seeing them in more and more places. And 
you know, whether it's your company's value system or, you know, whatever it is, you know, sometimes those get presented in sort of these frameworky kind of ways or, or how your company does uh, planning or OKR planning or something, you know, and so it's, it's kind of fun that once you start sort of seeing the matrix, you can start sort of questioning it in different ways. Yeah, that makes sense. I just started thinking as you were going through this and it was sort of like personas are sort of like a framework of thinking about design decisions. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, the definition of framework probably goes a lot deeper than uh, we normally think about it. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions here. Let's do, um, so you mentioned a couple of times throughout iterating on frameworks. Um, uh, the question is like, when would you know it's a good time to do that? And what if you're afraid you're going to break it? How do you approach that? Like, what if you break something that's good? Yeah, I think breaking things is good. You know, this is this is a moment where it's actually low risk in a lot of situations. So, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, again just like experimenting with a lot of different approaches and and getting feedback. You know, like. Uh, you know, technically I'm the manager, but just today I brought a framework I was working on to someone on my team because she has a really good mind for thinking these, these kind of things. And I was like, poke holes in this, you know, tell me why this shouldn't work and why it shouldn't. And she gave me really great feedback. And I'm going to go back to sort of the, 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 the planning board, you know, the, the sort of the, the drawing board on that one and stuff. So I think this is also a place where hopefully you're, you're around folks where there's some safety and you can experiment and try things. And if that's not your manager, it's a coworker, or it's both of them, but um, you know, having folks that can sort of uh, give you fresh eyes, just like any design. And again, it's the same sort of human-centered design approach. Um, all that is, is, is super useful. Cool. Uh, Luke asks, uh, can you recommend any, can you recommend a design review framework? Ooh, I'm probably not the best um, uh, situated person for this. I, I sort of, uh, uh, and that's a great question because I think a lot of the uh, design review cultures I've been a part of we never actually like explicitly stated, like we just sort of enter this room and we all kind of like teach each other what we do, but we have, we don't really have like a very formal way of articulating what it was. So I, you know, this could be a really cool way for you or, or someone else, maybe some other companies already have this, but what is the framework for what a design review is and how it works and, and all those kind of things. I think that, that could be really cool. Uh, Rob asks, in your professional career in design, have you recognized introverts in your team? If yes, have you observed any particular framework preference among them? That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, introvert is a, is a, is a tricky one. Um, you know, I think sometimes there's some some gender issues. You know, if there's a guy who's an introvert, they'll get treated differently than if there's a female that's an introvert. You know, we have to sort of deal with the the sort of implicit bias we have. Um, and, you know, I think there's room for all these kind of folks, but I've also seen that like, from that hiring bias, you know, if there's like a, a, a lot of times extroverts will want to hire extroverts and introverts will want to hire in other introverts. And I think you kind of have to find the right kind of balance of folks. And, you know, of course there's some debate as to, you know, what introvert really means, you know, does it mean someone that's quiet or does it mean someone that sort of gets like drained by social interaction? Um, you know, that's one nuance that I've heard. Like I, I actually really love interacting with people and going up and talking with people. It's just, I find it really exhausting. And so that's kind of one definition of, of introvert. Um, and, and so, you know, I think from a researcher perspective, some folks might call me a maverick, even though I also consider myself kind of like an introvert. And so that might seem like a, you know, like at least on the surface, like a bit of a contradiction, but, um, uh, you know, sort of thinking through that in different ways. So I think a lot of it is, is finding your own way, finding the different ways that you can provide value. And the, the other cool thing about, about frameworks is sometimes if you're more shy about putting yourself out there, it allows you to kind of put forward the framework rather than put forward the idea. And um, so it's sort of less about you. And so I've seen some folks that are maybe a little more humble or a little more reserved actually get a lot of impact and traction by sort of being able to frame things. And it allows you to kind of like, rather than put things out sort of bit by bit, you sort of put out this like one piece of thing where everything's already kind of assembled and kind of locked in. So if you, if you're someone that, you know, you put things out and you feel that like before you can kind of get out the full thought, you sort of get knocked aside, you know, maybe putting forward framework can be a way for you to sort of be able to present your perspective in a way um, where it's kind of fully baked. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me too. I was just thinking like I have, I have introvert tendencies and yeah, one of the characteristics is right. Like not wanting to come with a half format, half formed idea or not wanting to just like spitball or something. And I, frameworks are very good because it's, it's all there. Yeah. And then if it's somebody else's framework, it's not your framework, you know, so <laughs> they can pull it apart. It's not you. It's, 
Uh, I like that. Um, and uh, in the chat as well, Antonio from SDXD posted a link, um, something around design reviews too. So check that out. Yeah, great resource. Um, this next one, I like a lot. Uh, which framework has shifted your perspective the most and why? Shifted my framework the most. Um, I think it's like, I think it's the coaching stance one. You know, I think that so much of what we do and again in life just is all about sort of feedback and the better you get at giving and receiving feedback, um, it's, it's just going to make your life better. It's going to make you a better researcher. It's going to make you a better designer. It's going to make you a better collaborator. It's going to make you a better human. And it's hard, right? You know, you work on something so hard, you know, and, and, you know, I definitely worked with some folks where, you know, when we're, for instance, doing user research, um, everything, well, you know, it's because it was a prototype and it wasn't, you know, fully interactive, or it's because we recruited the wrong kind of user, you know, there's all this kind of excuse. And I've worked with other designers and they love it. They're like, how did I not think of that? This is amazing. This is rubbish. I'm glad they pointed this out, you know, sort of shifting your mindset to really, you know, inviting and wanting all that feedback and figuring out how and when and where to give feedback in different kinds of ways. It's just, it's just, it, it's really powerful. Cool. Yeah. Once again, I'll second that. Thanks for sharing that. I feel like that's, it seems so simple, but it's actually, it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, uh, the next one is, can you recommend a UX design case study framework to follow? And I'm, I'm not sure if I can totally read between the lines on exactly what it is, but I'm imagining like, uh, uh, it's almost like a framework for communicating the effectiveness of, of a project or something. Um, if that doesn't exist, somebody should make one because a lot of people could use that. Yeah, I think I think so. That that's that's probably uh, true. Although I, you know, I think it's also one of these funny things in the design world where, if everyone turns in the exact same template, then the template becomes not valuable. So there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg thing there. Um, uh, I I think I think less important than that to me though is whatever you do show your thought process and the decisions that you made. And so whether you're a researcher or a designer, you know, I don't care if you did six person, you know, usability study. I want to know why you decided to do that. I don't care why you decided to do a, a card-based navigation scheme. The important thing is sort of what was your thought process? Was it just that's the only thing you know how to do or that's what you always do? Or is it because there was some real motivation behind that? And so that's why, you know, I've actually seen in some of the really effective, uh, you know, um, portfolio pieces is, you know, using some of these kind of two by twos or kind of things to help folks understand, you know, I went with a card based navigation system because, you know, this was the situation I was facing and I really wanted to get this like upper right hand quadrant and this was the best approach for that. So, um, you know, uh, that's how I think about it. Cool. Once again, some stuff going on in the chat. So some other opinions there. And yeah, you hit a good point of um, if they all look the same, they kind of blend together. And I think that's that's something that uh, like boot uh, boot camps run into is when you're reviewing case studies and you go through like hundreds a day or something and they all look the same, they start to slip through the cracks. So that's maybe another example of iterating upon a framework that has been given to you uh, yeah. in that case to help you stand out a little bit. Um, all right. So it looks like we got three more questions here. Um, do you recommend any frameworks for post-test synthesis meetings for engaging stakeholders to share their observations from user research sessions? Yeah, um, I think this is also a place where, you know, frameworks can be really useful for sort of giving uh, guardrails. So rather than just asking people to kind of dump in their thoughts, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, thinking about sort of maybe you give them a spreadsheet and there's sort of different columns, like what you saw, what it meant and why it matters. Uh, uh, Adaptive Path had a sort of a framework for how to think of an insight. And I found that to be a really useful thing to share. Unfortunately, all their stuff got taken down when they got, they got acquired by, I forgot whether it was Citibank, Capital, one of the banks. Capital One. Capital One, thank you. Yeah, so they had these great resources on there from Adaptive Path, but I think you can maybe still find it in the Wayback Machine, but I think they had, a, as those were the three things. So I think it's, yeah, what you saw, uh, what it means and why it matters or something like that. And, and that's a great way for folks to sort of articulate what they're observing in a research session or something like that. Cool. Um, so we have, uh, Christopher asks, are there any frameworks you've come across and can recommend for going through design case studies and storytelling in general? So that might be a little, uh, the other question we talked about, but I'll leave it there. Yeah. I don't know if I have anything necessarily to add. I know this is a really emergent field. Um, 
uh, there's the, the the Pixar storytelling um, for UX. You can find that it's a Medium post. Um, and then also on Khan Academy, uh, Pixar has a storytelling, uh, not for UX, but just storytelling in general. And I think that their examples, hopefully folks can find that Medium post, but it's something like, Pixar storytelling, you know, UX, you should be able to find it. And I think that's a really great way of sort of thinking about it and sort of expanding your, your approaches to storytelling, um, both in terms of how you share, uh, whether it's in a design review or in a portfolio, and also just thinking about sort of their storytelling in the product experience itself, and that that's a, a powerful thing. So there, there are some great resources out there from, from Pixar. And obviously, they know what they're doing when it comes to storytelling. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Luke asks, how about content frameworks? And that's a Ooh, whole that's, genre in and yeah. of itself, I think, but. Yeah, um, we need a good uh, UX writer to come in and, and sort of talk about that. Uh, yeah, I guess that's a little vague that I'm not 100% sure what, what direction that goes in, but um, I, I'm, I'm sure there is some stuff out there, but nothing springs to, to mind uh, uh, right away. I'm trying to think back because we the a couple of events ago at Boulder Design we did um, a content focused one. There's some really good ones in there. I'm trying to remember if we have the recording of it. Um, okay. If we do, you can check out the Boulder um, the Boulder Design Group. I think I posted it on there. If not, I'm sorry, and I led you down a dead <laughs> path. But there were some good frameworks in there. I remember. Um, okay, and I think we have the last question, and it's a it's a zinger. It's a classic question. Uh -oh. Not not related directly to the the talk, maybe, but uh, curious to have your opinion on it. Uh, Rob asks. Uh, Leif, I have to ask, is, is the UX versus product designer just a title or is there substance behind this? Your thoughts? Oof. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's, here's what I say is the same title means different things at different organizations and different titles can mean the same thing at different organizations. I think that this is a classic case of like the, the wise men, the wise people and the elephant. And uh, there's such diversity of how human-centered design happens and there's regional diversity and there's sector diversity and sort of things like that, that like, I don't know, just personally, I'm not as invested in sort of the semantics of, of sort of this or that. I think that you know, if you really think about it more at the philosophical level of, of what it is that you're trying to do, find an organization that aligns with your philosophy of how you think about making products and experiences and services and, and stuff like that. And, you know, sort of, at least for me, who cares whether I'm a product researcher or a UX researcher or an insights researcher or whatever than that, you know, I want to go somewhere that hopefully is not in an ethical OS risk zone um, and is, uh, you know, doing something I, I care about and is approaching things with the right philosophy. So that, that would be my, my, um, my advice. Yeah, I like that answer. And I, I would, I would follow up with saying, yeah, don't worry about it because anybody who's hiring you probably isn't too concerned about if your title is UX designer or product designer, because I, hopefully they have the same mindset as that, that it's not all about titles. Um, uh, Leah, thank you so much. That was awesome. And thanks everybody for the great questions. So I'm going to turn it over to James uh, with some, some closing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jake, for moderating that Q&A. Appreciate the audience, all the wonderful questions. Leith, just an unbelievable, insight-packed, actionable presentation. We're so grateful 